Good morning to you, sir. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling well, thank you. Happy Martin Luther King Day. To you yeah. as well, sir. Appreciate you being able to come in today sure. and take advantage of the holiday. Clint, of course, chairman of the Solid Waste Authority. And uh, uh, before I get into that, Clint, can you tell me how long you've been chairman? I don't know how long I've been chairman. I've been on the Solid Waste Authority for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hit 30 years back in July. And for a vi- large pe- aspect of that, it's, I've been chairman or vice chairman, but uh, I really don't know the exact exact number of chairman. Give me give me the, uh, an idea of the scope of changes in the 30 years since you've been involved with this. Well, uh, the Solid Waste Authority, when I first got on, provided no services. Um, they uh, Prior to my time, they operated the old Berkeley County landfill. Um, by the time I came along, it was closed, and they provided no recycling service, no litter uh, control program. They uh, they just met once a month and paid a few outstanding bills, and that was it. Um, and over the 30 years, we've grown from not having any services to providing the West Virginia's largest recycling program and West Virginia's most aggressive litter control program as well. Um, this last year, 2022, we won, uh, the DEP has a, what they call West Virginia Make It Shine Clean County Contest. We won it first or second place for the last nine consecutive years. So we've come out of the basement and we're as best as they get in West Virginia. Who are some of the other folks involved in running the solid waste? Yeah, I'm so happy you asked that question. I mean, there's one of the reasons for our success has been there's been some really hardworking folks that's been on on the board or even has left board and come on as staff. Um, one that comes to mind is a fellow that's passed away. He was a dear friend of mine, uh, lived in Inwood. His name was Edgar Mason. And a lot of people knew him as the unofficial mayor of Inwood. Mm-hmm. Um, he taught me a lot and I miss that man every day. Uh, but there was also other folks. There was a fellow by the name of Jerry Fitzgerald who was on the board for 15 years. He has since moved to Florida. Uh, Lynn Lashley, um, was a Tomahawk area resident. She um, she moved to Jefferson County and she left the board and now works part time for us. Um, also, John Christensen, um, who lives out in the Hedgesville area, is on the board. So, and we've got some new folks, some new blood. Michelle Atha uh, joined uh, about six months ago, and it's uh, I always find it fun to, to see that new energy. Very good. Billy? Yeah, you mentioned Jerry Fitzgerald. Uh, he and his wife, Louise, moved to Sanibel. Uh, and, that, of course, that was hit so bad by the hurricane. Have you talked to Jerry since then? I have. I have. Um, I, I actually heard secondhand that everything was fine very, very early after the storm that everything was fine, that they, they didn't even lose electricity. That's what I was told. Mm-hmm. But, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a month after the storm, I talked to Jerry himself and uh, – he and Louise were fine. Uh, they did lose electricity, but uh, th- other than the discomfort of that, everything was everybody was good. Did they ride through the storm on Sanibel? Or you know, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I, th- I think they did, but I'm not a hundred percent sure of that. Yeah, I, I. Thanks for telling because I've often wondered how they survived because Sanibel was was hit pretty bad. It was a uh, uh, target zero for the storm. If I remember right, he told me there was no way in or no way out. Exactly. Out. Yeah. 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 Jim Smith was another one's on your board for a while. He was there for about ten months. Oh, is that all? So I thought it was short, a short okay. period of time. I thought it was much yep. longer. Okay, yeah. yeah, Kevin. Yeah, you know what? I don't know an awful lot about the um, solid waste program. Can you tell me a little bit about what you got going on? Well, right sure. Now? Well, let's start. Let's start with recycling. Um, we um, back in 1994, actually uh, spring of '95, we started the Berkeley County Recycling Program. It's a predominantly a drop-off program. We have three locations in the county, one in Inwood, one in Martinsburg, and one in Hedgesville. And it has grown over the years. It originally just accepted, you know, the basic cans, glass, paper, and it has grown to collect more than 20, 22 items. Uh, We've gone, we've got into organics, brush, uh, lumber, yard waste, things that um, our budget could afford and it could reasonably be recycled in the area. Um, folks might remember the, the uh, Inwood tire pile if you lived here in the yeah. 1990s. Uh, we worked with the DEP to get that cleaned up and uh, they paid for it. We did a lot of the local work and as a result they, the DEP deeded us that land and that's where the South Berkeley Recycling Center operates from. 
is the old Inwood Tire Paul site. Mm. Who can forget the old Tire Paul Far? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. 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 Um, As it came to be known. Uh, and that was a motivator for Edgar Mason for uh, uh, volunteering to be on our board. That literally was in his backyard, and, and he was tired of mosquitoes, and he was tired of the concern about uh, that facility, and, and he just thought he wondered if something could be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a facility in Martinsburg, Kevin, or near Martinsburg, called the Grapevine Road Recycling Center. It is obviously on Grapevine Road. It is uh, next to the old Berkeley County landfill that was actually a city-county venture that started in 1969 and ran until 1991, if memory serves me right. Uh, These sites are about five acres in size. Um, Hundreds and hundreds of cars every day were open. Uh, We have a smaller site out in Hedgesville that's on uh, land that's loaned to us. It's at Eagle Plaza, and it only accepts those basic cans glass and paper um, items yeah and grapevine road is the the only one that i've been familiar with over the years i've i've had no reason to to go to any others so uh, there isn't there isn't that on grapevine road where the facility that had that you had to shut down for a little bit yeah now let's talk about in sorga yeah in sorga, west virginia is the name of the facility and sorga is a private facility uh it was actually a collaboration of four or five different companies um the largest of which was originally called BioHiTech. They changed their name to Renovare. They're a New York-based company. They teamed up with Apple Valley Waste and uh, a company out of Italy called Insorga and, other, and a couple other companies. And they um, proposed to lease 12 acres of land on the Solid Waste Authority's property to take mixed trash mixed household waste and to create a fuel and they operated for three years Um, in those three years they were fairly successful they had 146,000 pounds of waste come into the facility which is pretty close to 3,500 garbage trucks Uh, and they produced about 45,000 ton uh, 45,000 pounds of of, I'm sorry, tons, 45,000 tons of uh, fuel for the Argos facility. Um, in October of 2021, to go back on time a little bit, uh, they held a meeting with the Solid Waste Authority and they said, look, we're looking at expansions. Um, they also held similar meetings with the Development Authority. They were looking to expand their operation. They were looking at and bringing in what's called a food digester. Um, the, um, by February, they had quit accepting waste. And in April, they sent us a letter that said, uh, we are temporarily closing. So it, really, the closing caught all of us off guard. We did not see that happening. Um, we were concerned when we saw trucks not coming, of course, and starting in February, we were concerned and we would talk to them. And, uh, and the, the reason that they gave in the letter for closing was the same reason that they had been giving us through February and March was that there was a a, a relationship problem with Argos. Uh, Argos was down frequently, as they say, they said. Um, I don't know that from any other source. Excuse me a second, Clint. Argos is what? Argos is the um, cement company that's uh, sure, sure, on sure. the south okay. end of Martinsburg. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Big Tower. And, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I know what it was. I, yeah, sorry about that. I yeah. drew a blank. Okay. That's, who the, that's who used the fuel. Now, Argos burns um, coal by the train load, and uh, this SRF, this fuel that they could make from trash, had roughly the same BTU as coal, burned cleaner, and it seems to be, frankly, seems to be possibly the wave of the future for solid waste management there's a lot of srf facilities jumping up all over the united states i just read an article a couple weeks ago about one in florida now it wasn't in sorga it was somebody else's technology but um it there does seem to be a lot of interest in using waste to make a solid fuel so um anyway back to the situation here Um, week after week would go by and they would talk about Argos being down they would talk about uh, the equipment that feeds the fuel being down Um, and then and then the closure and even in the context of the closure when they told us they were going to close it was you know this is just going to be temporary this is just going to be a few weeks Um, and uh, we knew there was trouble when all employees were laid off 
because uh, they had kept the employees through the closure and they were there at the site uh, doing maintenance and other routine activities and then when all next thing you know all the employees are gone then we were really concerned any idea how many employees that entailed i think at their peak they had 20 25 employees they were fairly well-paying jobs at, and i and i got to know a few of them uh, you know i would call them friends and it was you know really sad to see that happen to them and we and regard the, this and, as a permanent closure yeah. now it is not i mean i um so let's go forward um let's see starting in july uh, we noticed smoldering coming from the building uh, in fact um in late july i called 911 myself and said look well, i need i need help i need fire department over here uh, there was another fire came in october uh, apple valley jumped up even though they had no legal requirement to do so uh, they they volunteered to clean the facility out and this and keep in mind um uh, much to our surprise even though they hadn't been taking waste uh, and they were you know uh, they were not making fuel so there was the building was pretty much full sadly and there is a performance bond with the state to clean that out but it would take months to get that released so apple valley jumped up probably spent more than a half a million dollars uh, in, the, in the following months to clean the facility out and today the biostabilization hall that there's this giant room that's all concrete walls and floors is now empty and so the threat of smoldering is is gone the threat of a fire is gone um, throughout this summer on several occasions i have given uh, tours to companies that were interested in the facility uh, some of those were made available to us at, uh, at the request of Apple Valley. Some were made available to us at the request of the Italians, the Insorga, original Insorga contingent. There is a lot of interest uh, in turning that facility back online. Back online, doing the same thing as the original concept. Yes. I mean, yeah. there's been other conversations, Bill. I mean, there's thoughts of, well, could we make a transfer station out yeah. of it? Could we make a recycling operation out of it? And you might see that happen, but there is a lot of interest in making SRF. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would imagine that they would have to have uh, more than one customer, because I think that's the downfall when you have everything in. For sure. And all your eggs in one basket. and. And for that, and I'm so glad to hear you say that it's cleaner fuel because uh, Argos, on a on a regular basis, my car is full of soot and dust that comes from that uh, that plant. And uh, anything that they could do to make it cleaner, I'm all on board with. Let me pick up on a uh, point that you made earlier, Clint, that our, uh, that the understanding is that Argos did not have the same demands that they thought they had initially. Do you know any, have any insight to that? Was that actually the... I, I actually don't have any um, conversations with Argos. There was a private company that managed the intake of the fuel, and their, their name was Kiln Direct, and, and I talk to Kiln Direct all the time. Mm -hmm. And some of the downtime that they had, Bill, was just scheduled maintenance but it would be an extended period of time it could be four five or six weeks so, so if if you've got as 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 kevin said you got one market and it's down you, you know where can you sell your material the the second thing that i'm hearing from kiln direct and again i'm taking it at face sure. value is that the equipment that the italians installed at argos did not work properly it was cited or fitted for Europe and it did not work well here and so that my understanding is that that equipment's been gutted out it's been yeah. removed okay. and if if Argos comes back online um, to use the SRF uh, it would have to be with new equipment now uh, before I finish this statement let me say this from what I understand from Kiln Direct even if Insorga doesn't come back online Argos will start burning SRF. They will buy it from somewhere else. Okay, fine. and that will be a, a, a shame to see that happen. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the equipment not been uh, wasn't uh, did not work well in the states. Uh, as I understand it, the, the and Sarga was the first plant of its kind in the U.S. But there were something like fifteen to twenty plants operating in Europe. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, and that number has grown, Bill. Yeah. I mean, I've heard twice that number yeah. now. Okay. 
Um, and yeah, Insorga, Insorga was patented. They had a patented process, and it, we were the first of the Insorga mm -hmm. patent here in the United States. But there is probably 50 SRF facilities in the United States that take a certain select amount of waste mm -hmm. and make a solid recovered fuel with it. The the um, as I understand it, that at, when this problem was being discovered, you said it kind it kind of opened up bit by bit. Three groups have really jumped to the table, uh, Apple Valley, Solid Waste Authority, and the county. The three of you work very closely together, I think, trying to resolve the problem. Uh, looking forward, that had to have had an impact on your revenue stream. Absolutely. Okay, would you talk to that, please? Yeah, we were getting $28,250 a quarter from the lease, the land lease of that facility. Plus, we were getting 50 cents a ton for any waste that went into the facility. So. You know, it's been um, it's been close to a year now since you know they were accepting waste and they have they didn't pay any lease money all of 22. So we're down 120, 130 thousand um, uh, dollars. We've had to make some serious cutbacks. People who use Grapevine Road know that we closed on Mondays. The Inwood facility does not take plastic, which is uh, you know a, a crying shame. Um, we've had some full-time employees go part-time we've had employees lose benefits we've had lo employees lose their job we had to make cutbacks um, the county council um, increased their allocation to us and I think it was an additional 42,000 or so maybe it was 46 and um, and that um, helped get us through last year now with that said um, 2023 should be a better year it's given us time to write grants and sort of get more grounded from a financial side. Um, a couple days ago, uh, West Virginia DEP announced a $144,000 grant for our recycling program. The Solid Waste Management Board a few weeks back, another $12,000. And, um, and it's not really to address growth like grants typically are. We usually buy infrastructure, buy equipment, or, or build facilities. It's, it's to sustain our program. Glenn Hogman is our guest here on the program. We reset for those of you just uh, tuning in. He is the chairman of the Solid Waste Authority. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that um, Inwood would not accept plastics, and uh, yet uh, a Grapevine does. Uh, you've had a challenge, my understanding, of uh, getting uh, getting markets for your various products, mm -hmm. including plastics, including some of the others. How do you market that? How do you get rid of the material, Clint? Well, it, it's each and every item is different. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll take plastic since you brought it up. Right now, plastics uh, goes to the Apple Valley Recycling Facility over in Hagerstown, Maryland. Uh, prior to that, we were marketing it to Insorga. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were able to accept a very broad range of plastic, and it was being used to make fuel uh, there at Insorga. But uh, paper uh, goes to Chambersburg Waste Paper. Um, there's a lot of our metals go to conserve it over in Hagerstown, uh, and then it gets a little bit more complicated when you get into our electronics and, and other and, and other items. So, the commodity markets for recycling has been the most difficult that I've seen in my 30 years. We've watched companies like Zuckerman's, who was in business 100 years, go out of go out of business. Halltown went out of business. Were you sending paper to Halltown before they stopped? We accepting? were sending ours to Chambersburg Waste Paper who was sending it to Halltown. Halltown. And as a result of that, because Halltown would, you had a lot of these in market facilities only accept recyclables that's been processed. I'll mm -hmm. use air quotes here, processed. And CWP, Chambersburg Waste Paper did that processing for us. So as a result, um, we're now having to pay $30 a ton to get rid of mixed paper, where before it, we would be paid fifteen dollars a time. Big difference, and hey, so another hit on that budget, right? Bill, if you could, we're, yeah, we're just about that, out of yeah. time, and I want to make sure I get this yeah. question in because I'm not sure when we're going to talk to Clint again. And this has to do with certificate of need. The West Virginia Legislature is no doubt going to be considering some laws regarding certificate of need as it applies to your industry, Clint. Any thoughts for the legislature? Uh, well, let's watch the terminology. Certificate of need, as it applies to solid waste, applies to landfills. There is a certificate of convenience and necessity that applies to waste hauling. So my question for the person asking the question would be, which of those two are you talking about? Um, 
I'm not aware that anybody is considering legislative changes to those laws. If they are, we'll certainly entertain them. We've got some smart legislators around here. We've worked with them before. There are advantages to both of those types of certificates, and there are disadvantages to them. Um, and uh, I have, I, I think our Solid Waste Authority has very little interest in changing permitting paths for landfills to make it easier. Uh, I, I don't think there's any advantage to the Eastern Panhandle for that. We might be open to modernization of the certificate of convenience and necessity, um, particularly as it relates to waste haulers that haul to businesses. Um, the board has had the opinion for a long time that that could be more broad, that could be open to more uh, open competition. Uh, however, and this gets very technical, but however, on the residential side, uh, the board is of the opinion that one hauler works best. So that would go against what uh, a lot of the folks in legislature talk about, which is open market, free market competition. Well, I don't have much time you have here, but I only have about 30 seconds for your reply. On let's that, go so. back to uh, 1985 before the law was there. And um, when I left home, I moved to Little Georgetown area where I live now, and I had no waste cut haulers, none. That's what it was before the certificate of convenience and necessity. You had to live in a high density area. And that resulted in hundreds and hundreds of open dumps across Berkeley County, not just Berkeley County, across the state. The certificate of convenience and necessity fixed that. And they fixed some other things related to universal service, which will take another day to explain. Because it made the haulers come to every house. For the same price. Even if it wasn't convenient. provide the same service. Yeah. And we could, I'd love to get into that more with you as, the, uh, as we move along here during this legislative session. Thanks so much for coming by, Clint. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank you for the Thanks time. Clint. Very informative.